we're back with part three of this week's special um, footy eve Melbourne Punisher show pods. Now we're talking about, I mean, I'm sure it's obvious to the um, viewers that how passionate Mickey is about racing and about sporting yep. in general. And like, I was a long time listener of RSM when Mick was on there with um, Michael, Michael Christian. Yep. And it's a, for me personally, it's been a real a, a sad thing that you guys aren't still there because it was always obvious to me how much passion both of you guys had for racing and the depth of your knowledge. And when you did the trainer interviews and um, you know just talked about it in general, you could tell that you got what punters were experiencing, and th- and there was a, a connection with punters, yeah. which to me now, unfortunately, they've completely lost. And it, you know, they, everyone's had their own opinion of the direction they've gone in and um, what where they've ranked racing in importance to them. But it feels to me, my perception of it is that racing's just become a token part of their their coverage, which I, I think particularly is, is disappointing. So yeah. Just before you chime in there, Mick, I'll give my background. I've been listening to the Greater Three Years Ed Sport 927 RSN since I was about eight or nine when Leon Weyard and uh, Raymond Slug Jordan yeah. hosted the breakfast show. And I've listened all the way through, including when I worked night shift for Sporting Index in England. And I'd sit there, and because I was starting at 10 o'clock at night, it was when the breakfast show was sort of starting. And last, the last couple of years, um, through the work that you guys did, and I believe Adam White was a little bit behind by getting that into Sanctum stuff, where you were having, well, you had Mark Murphy, Nathan Jones, you had all the AFL footballers coming in. We put the sword to Travis Clark. Yes. <laughs> but, but it had never been better, and then all of a sudden, for no apparent reason, it got completely dismantled, and like, it's very sad the state that the station's in at the minute, and... Like, I know everyone will say, oh, we're going to, to bat for Ralphie in that as well, but, like, as, as we've said previously, that 9 to 10 hour on a Monday morning used to be compulsive listening and it, drew, it drove the discussion for the industry, and now it's just a complete mess. If we're specifically talking about their racing coverage, if you remove Dean Lester from their current... Yep. ..what they put out, it would be completely unlistenable. It would be not worth listening to. And, and now so, they're doing their best. You know, I almost get the feeling I could be. This is just my opinion. So no one, I don't even want to take this in a But I get the feeling that Dean's almost like struggling to put his name to it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because it's it's so devoid of any substance apart from him. Anyway, he's good at what he does, yeah. Dean. Yeah. Um, we 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 had enormous amount of respect for Dean and him making up his time to give us an insight into his racing knowledge and his tips of course and we're trying to deliver um, messaging in a positive way to entice people to have a bet based on having a trusted performer who knows how to uh, get winners. Uh, The the trainers one I felt was really interesting. Um, We we believe that Chris O did as a breeder in the industry. I love a bet. Um, I just love the racing full stop whether it be trots, dogs or, or gallops. In order, it's probably dogs. Uh, sorry, gallops, trots, and then dogs. But I've got a passion for the whole three. Yeah. But to talk to you know Robert Smurden at six twenty every morning, or some other nondescript trainer who's having a good run, uh, whether it be Amy Johnson who went through a fantastic patch for a period, or a Shay, a Shay, for example. Shade. Um, we felt that really invigorating to us yeah. because they're faces that I've never been connected to because of my probably lack of getting to racetracks like I used to um, due to time and doing other type of work. Um, I felt it really invigorating for us to talk to the major players of that day and our responsibility was to try to look at the form the night before, give our producer an insight into who we think could win a race which would help the punter listen yeah. to the show. And we felt we'd done a pretty good job on that. That's the part I like. like the Saturday morning smorgasbord is not really much help to punter because mm. it's just light them up and get them through. You, it was clear to me that you guys were making decisions about that. Yeah. And you were focusing on trainers that were having a, a hot streak. Hot streak, or, yeah. Or yeah. had chances. Or yeah. had chances. We, we were there to try to deliver winners, and we're not going to get it right every time. No. I know that. Um, but when you sort of can earmark a Robert Smurden on a Friday or a Thursday in the view that he's got five or six runners yeah. on a Saturday, or the same if it had been a Peter Moody or whatever yeah. it may be, we felt that we were delivering news not only in the short term for that day, 
but over the next 48 yeah. hours, people can save their money and say, well, gee, I've got a good push for a big price on this horse. Uh, I'll wait till Saturday, I won't have a bet today. Mm. So we felt the longer term future, uh, the, the longer term predictions were just as important. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So how many years did you do the radio show then? Oh, mate, I've been connected with RSN, and I, I can't pot them. Um, RSN were fantastic to me for yeah. a long, long time, Potsy. Like, they made a decision that I didn't agree with, yeah. and we were strong in our views at the time. And that's their call, that's fine. But to answer your question, I've been in and out of that since the station since 1990. Wow. Um, I was doing an Up the Creek segment with Mick McGuan, um, going back to past AFL greats, what are they doing now? Working with Peter Donegan, Kevin Barlett, um, you know, had great respect for those two guys who accepted me under their wing. But then probably for the last seven years uh, to do the Brecky show with Chris O, who's been the mainstay, uh, he done 13 years straight, but that time of morning, you know, yeah. it's, the, it's the graveyard shift, they call it, yeah. and they do it for a reason. And when you're top and tail on the day, um, with getting up early, watching Wimbledon until 2 o'clock in the morning, <laughs> yeah. watching the Ashes, exactly, yeah, yeah. because we want to watch Australia beat England, we want to watch Clayton York knock over whoever yeah. he's playing. We've got a responsibility to those that wake up at 5.20, they set like, their alarm up. Like me? And they turn... I didn't know what happened overnight. We've got to deliver the news at 5.35 to say this is why X won and yes. this is the reason why I believe. I don't want to sit back and listen to some news journalist who's got no comprehension of sporty rights about it but doesn't understand yeah. why a team won or lost or an individual won or lost. I prefer to give my insight as to my reasons as to what I saw. Yeah. Your own eyes are your best form of judgment. I firmly believe in that. If I haven't seen it, I just used to tell our listeners, I didn't see it, I can't comment. Or, or the key... No use fluffing your way around it. Or the key incidents that led to the result. Absolutely. Because... And from a future perspective, yeah. from a betting angle, they can bank it, store it, use it, wipe their backside with it, doesn't matter. But at least you gave an insight into what you thought. Um, I don't think that... I don't think the people out there who listen to the station realise how big of an effect the passing of Steve Cairns mm. from an outsider looking in had on that station. Because when he let Nadia have also pretty much, I think, free reign with that, the preview show after 10 o'clock, when she was getting the likes of Don Byrne, Snowy... Hello, Nathan. Um, uh, Daniel O'Sullivan, she was rounding up. Oh, Ralphie did it. Can't leave Ralph out either. That was must listening. Yeah, like especially on the Friday. That's exactly the, right. I don't, I don't, we shouldn't brush past that. Yeah. There was a period there where there was such substance to what they were yeah, providing yeah. Mm. that every professional punter I knew was listening. Absolutely. Because it was moving it was the angle. market. Yeah, absolutely. So even if you disagree or whatever, you had to be aware of what Dominic Byrne or Dan was putting out, yeah. Dan O'Sullivan was putting out over the radio. Yeah. So you could, if you want, you had to be... Yeah, because if they were one, you weren't aware of it, to be with that them. market was going to move yeah. really quickly yeah. and you were going to be left behind. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so that's, that's sort of the past, but um, let's have a look at this year's footy, Vic. Oh, yeah. I went through and had a, I've been having a real good look over the last three or four days and I was listening over the past few weeks and, of course, I'm a Mad Carlton supporter and been, as you know, growing up down here in Melbourne, it's just... Footy all the time, well, not even Melbourne, in Victorian. Like I spend a lot of time in the country, like always talking country footy as well and local footy. But I think the AFL have created a bit of a monster here with GWS, haven't they? Can yeah, they have. have. What price are they? They're four fifty to win the flag. And yeah, where, where does that sit? Is that is that a back ball? Too, too short or? On the 25th of February, I took Humidor to win the Australian Cup in the GWS and into Winks for a futures treble. There we go. So, well, I, for the punters, I, right? think, <laughs> I think they're clearly potentially the best team before a bounces ball, yeah. uh, the ball yeah. has bounced. I have not seen in my time, and I watch footy pretty closely, a group of players who run and weigh run as strong yeah. as they do over the two hours on a more consistent basis yeah. to the opposition. They'll have a little peak and trough every now and then again, and they'll dip in performance on the back of fatigue. But generally speaking, the Scullys, Coniglios, all their stars through the middle, middle Kelly, you've got Stevie Johnson, who was probably the difference. If he plays against the Western Bulldogs up there, does he kick one, does he manufacture two others? Is it their story we're talking about rather than the Bulldogs? We never know the answer to that. But as a collective, with another 12 months of preparation, another three months of solid work, I can see them elevating themselves to star status. Well, I'm thinking about from a racing point of view, so it might not apply. It might be completely wrong, but I'm thinking about how much they improved last or the last a, two years. Yeah. That the improvement's so rapid, yeah. And as a group, they seem to be peaking, and that, that what they need, as long as they're held together well mentally, yeah. Boy, they'll be. This, it just seems to me that they'd be incredibly hard to beat. They will be hard to beat. And, and 
They need some luck. Yeah. Um, everyone needs luck. Everyone needs luck with injuries. Footy gods have got to be over them. There's no doubt about that. But on pure face value, before a bounce, a ball is bounced, I've got no doubt they're the side to be. Well, I've got, there's a couple of critical things that I've really got in, in my mind going into the season. They need to keep Mumford fit because I think with this no third up rule, if you've got a, an elite ruckman, you're a long way ahead of the pack. Is that happening, Chappie? That no third up Yeah, there's no third up rule. Yeah, it's so. Well, see, that's an interesting debate in itself. Like, this game's been playing for 100 plus years. Yeah. The game's built on instinct and reflex and intuition. Yeah. If a smart midfielder's around the action and the ball gets slightly thrown to the left, I'm going to impact that footy because it's not my fault the elevator no. don't go to the top floor with some ruck. Yeah. So I've read the ball before they have, so I've got free ride to get it. Now, getting it. now that's going to be dried up to a point. Yeah. Second part of that is we've jumped to shadows. Now, the amount of stoppages there are in footy. And we rely on a bad injury to a sand lens or whoever yeah. it may be who gets a knee in the rib cage, breaks some ribs, we tend to jump at shadows yeah. now. The political world we live in well, on the back of injury prevention is hurting this game. It's a combative game, uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, Poxy and Juppie. We know that. You're yeah. probably from Sydney in a rugby background. Yeah. That's a collision sport. Yeah. Footy is a 360 degree, degree collision, collision sport. sport. Yeah. So you have to know exactly where they're coming from at all given times. And if you wanted the example of that, Nick, go and watch some of the early rounds of the AFLW where those girls had to learn real quick that it's a 360 degree contact sport. Yeah. Because a lot of them didn't have the awareness that you see that the juniors come in, like the draftees now come in and it's just ingrained in them. But with those girls, they didn't quite have it yet. But as you say, like they might as well, let's call it for what it is, it's a mark blitz out through. They've, they've gone out and picked up a kid who was an elite steeple chaser who's tall and can run all day and can jump and he was giving them an advantage and everyone's going, well, how can we let them have this advantage? We've got to legislate it out of the game. Yeah, but even the, the lawmakers say that the third up doesn't give teams a much advantage, so why have them? Well, is it for really you to a, a, a apply that theory in numbers? Well, if a side wants to have that as a tactical advantage, yeah. let them use it. And if it doesn't work, there'll be a consequence on the back of that. The opposition may score because they've got an extra at ground level who might win that ball. I'm, I'm, I'm just so is the third up? I'm sorry for my um, no, naivety because I'm. I that's just, good. I, I, I just, I'm a spectator as far as AFL is concerned. I don't bet on it. Yeah. I just watch it and, and enjoy it. So is it everything? It's throw-ins. Throw yeah, the whole lot. around the ground. Right, everything. Right. Basically, yeah. it's, it's back to under tens where they go. You're you and you. You and you. Well, the right. And he's going to throw and up. That's it. Fill the ground. No one else can touch it. Yeah. Or, or yes. Too late. Or one of them. You shark. Yeah. 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 So it's, it's it's one of those changing landscapes of the footy, but. but purest thing, just leave the game alone. But that's the thing, Nick. They haven't given the coaches enough time to coach against it. If you give the coaches enough time, doesn't matter what sport it is, they will come up with a strategy to combat it. Yeah. Because this will flow on to the next thing that I want to talk to you about. I've been spending so, a bit so of time... So what impact will it have? What, what, what's the likely impact? Will it, will it, will it make cl like the clearances more decisive or less? I, I think what you'll find is, is that if you, as I said earlier, if you've got a dominant ruckman, if you've got one of the top five or six ruckmen, you're going to be at a greater advantage. Say, so a team like, if they've got, if GWS have a fit Mumford, mm. and if say, Essendon get an injury to like a Lewenberger, they basically have got no ruck depth at Essendon, really. They're at a massive disadvantage because they're going to get an extra probably five or six clearances just on the back of the ruck work. I can see it having a detrimental effect to the actual aesthetics of the game. Ooh. Aaron Sanderland's probably the most pertinent point. He's six foot eleven. He's yeah. everyone's concerning inches to him. So what does the opposition do? Do we allow our ruckman to go one on one against them? The rules said we have to. Ooh. But to combat a nat five or to combat other midfielders, we'll roll up other midfielders yeah. to make more density around the footy. Yeah. So they're not actually going to get what they want. Yeah. They're going to have more collisions, they're going to have more numbers around the ball because there's no one known. I'm going to allow Sandlin just to go lace out to five. Fife, Fife can weave through traffic and then hit up whoever may be there for now yeah. that Pavlich is gone. So more density around the footy could yeah. add, add to more stoppages. It'll so be, that, that would be a concern. Yeah, it, it'll so lead to more repeat space. stoppages, for sure. And I hope it doesn't because so, we want the ball moving. Mm. So as I was saying, Mick... Um, I've spent a bit of time out in the West lately. They're all rejuvenated out there. They're all up and about on the back of the Premiership. But all these coaches have now had four or five months to dissect that game, dissect that game plan. Well done to Luke Beveridge. He came up with a game plan. Many people thought it wouldn't hold together in the finals. Well, he proved him completely wrong. It completely held together in the finals. They won the lot. But I know they get Bob Murphy back. But is there, have they... 
have they spent all the chips now? I know they're going to be there or thereabouts, but I, I doubt from my perspective I can see them going back to back. One, one, one word you have to deal with in sport is that dreaded word called complacency. Yep. I call it the success disease. Yep. And we don't know what their heads are like right now. Um, if they're rounded and they keep their feet on the ground and they're reaching, reaching their KPIs of last year but also improving on that because the game is about constant, never-ending improvement. Yep. If you think what you achieved last year will be good enough, you're delusional. It just yep. doesn't happen that way. So I think as a leader of their group and Bob Murphy to invigorate the group by coming back into it, I think they'll be driving them the right way. The biggest thing, which will tell a story on Friday night, them being a grand final winner yep. and then the celebrations prolonging their probably act to get back their hands dirty and doing some work. Collingwood will be interested to see how they go with the advantage of having probably six months a better preparation. Yes, they've got some injury concerns, but ever if ever a side's vulnerable, it's in round one. Yes. What will what will tend to hear, listen to post round one, those that were expected to win the get beat, oh they're not going as good as what yeah. we thought. Those that we gave no hope have a victory, they're oh, going yeah. better than what we thought. Yeah. And this will be the changing landscape for the first month. But what I'll be looking for is their appetite for the contest. Yep. That is generally the first signal to say, have they got the appetite for contest? Yep. If you're not good around the contest, you get exposed pretty quickly in the opposition prior in the week. Yep. So and that's they, generally they, driven by attitude. As a viewer's, you know, an arm's length viewer point of view, they, they, watching them during the finals, they seem to grow massively throughout that finals campaign in belief. Yeah, absolutely. Is there a chance that that belief might have even, you know, come further and Absolutely. they might think they're yeah. indestructible. I've they always can... been a firm believer, Juppy, that winning's a habit and so is losing. I bet you if you back three out of three in your first three selections, you like your fourth bet, you'll probably bet more. Mm. Uh, whereas your yeah. first three bets, Mr. Mark, Not really, I know exactly what you're, you're talking about. Saying, yeah. It affects your psychology in a lot of way. But yeah. you might be disciplined to a point yeah. betting to your staking plan. Whereas others that turn their fifty dollars into four hundred over the their hard first three bets, they yeah. might have <laughs> yeah, but they might have two fifty yeah. on it. Yeah. And it's that that philosophy of just saying winning breeds success yeah. and breeds confidence. Yeah. Yeah. It's the actions that breeds the confidence. And if they believe that they've got to get to where they got to last year on the back of good actions, mm. they'll rediscover that pretty quickly. Mm. But the preparation phase of any summer period is exactly when the work's got to be done. Mm. If you haven't got to your benchmarks in terms of your running ability or your weight is not under control, Jack Watts for example, yeah. uh, your season will plateau and plateau pretty quickly, irrespective of how many pre seasons you've done beforehand. We call it residual fitness. Yep. Some survive on it, and some have to be pulled back a little bit to be nurtured through a summer so yep. they can get the best out of them in season, but others just need to work. Mick, there's a couple of teams that I want to talk to you about that I sort of, well, one I've got, I hope I've got a reasonable handle on, and one I, I, I sort of struggle with a bit, and one of them is your boys, Collingwood. For mine, I can't say make up the finals. I, I think they're, they're still in a rebuilding phase. I know the pressure's going to come on Buckley, I don't like the, the the recruits they've got in over the summer. I think they're too old, and I don't think they were much good at clubs that they were at. Um, yeah, I'll take the exception have, to Daniel Wells. Well, but the, 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 only, the only problem I've got with Wells is is that I, I think they can only get 15 or 16 games out of him maximum. Yeah. But Linda Dunn was a journeyman at Melbourne, Yeah. and I don't think he's going to be a superstar there. That's that's their biggest issue down back. I think Ben Reid's clearly their best mm. player. Um, most, well, not best player, most important player. But... If he goes down and breaks yeah. down, Collingwood's fortunes clearly go yeah. in a rearward direction. Um, the back half is a little bit of a concern. I'm not sure their ball use is as good as what it could be and yeah. should be. I know they've got some developing players down there. Yeah. I like young Josh Smith. I think he'll elevate himself to a, a not a bad defender or even a winger. And in time, he'll probably go to midfield. But generally speaking, what they've got to get right is their style in defence. Last year, when we witnessed Port Adelaide kick seven goals over the back, all because their zone defence, their gap control, their communication wasn't right. They didn't trust their players up the ground. For an 18-man zone defence who were pressing the ground to make it small and make it difficult for the opposition to come out was something that they had to work on. Nathan Brown's not there, Jack Frost is not there, they've gone to other clubs. Yeah. But when you watch these guys behind the goal or even side on, at the point of a Hawthorne winning the ball, they had to hold firm. But what they tended to do, because their opponent, Jack Gunston, was sliding to the goal yep. square, they started to retreat, they back. which then opened up mm, space. pockets of space yep. for Jordan Rennes or Sam Mitchell to pierce at 45s and give it to a Cyril or a Poppy, and then they get it over the back to a Bruce. Yep. 
when you've got this 18-man team defence, if you don't trust in explicitly everyone on that ground Correct. at that given it time, work. holes open up yeah. and gets bit. That's why they went back to civil coverage down back. If we get beat here, at least they're kicking to a contest here, yeah. and then we learn to fight another day. That's one of the sad things. To me. I don't go to many games. I watch them on TV. You don't get that on TV, do you? No, you don't. It's very you really yeah. have to go, yeah, watch it at the ground, yeah. where you can see things unfolding. Yeah. two or three kicks ahead. And not only that, generally you have to almost do it at elevation. Yeah, mm. you, you need to sit on the the at least the middle of, of the stand to see it open up above you. Another they should, they should have had more of those wide shots on the on the TV coverage. I think it'd be. Or, per, or just a personal view, I suppose. Or at least, yeah. or at least when there's a break in play, cut to it just so yeah. that the let the special comments guys talk about it. Mm. Mick, another team that you've had a connection with St Kilda back in the day. Yep. Everyone sort of tipping them to go ahead this year, hopefully make the finals. I, I was on a podcast with the boys the other week. They were even money against Melbourne. I put that out to the punters that definitely take that price because I couldn't see them not going off favourite in this first game. Where do you have them sort of uh, finishing up? Do you have them sort of in that finals mix or do you think they've still got more progression to go? No, I think they're nearly ready. Yeah. Um, I was really impressed the way Richo and his boys went about it. He's, a, he's a great coach. I think he's in, one, in the top three coaches in the, in the league. Yeah, he's a lovely guy. Yeah. Um, does a lot of right work in the right way. Yeah. Um, his communication skills are great. Um, he trusts his players, yep. which is really important. Let's face it, coaches are subservient to the players. Yep. They have to be. We're there to yep. serve them. And at the end of the day, with St Kilda, they've got now a lot of their midfield group have got to that 50, 60, 70 games. Yep. Melbourne hasn't beaten them since 06, yep. when they beat St Kilda when I was on the coaching yep. staff down at St Kilda. Um, that was the last time they beat us. Well, and David Needs played. Yep. And Nathan Jones had hair. Yeah, and had hair. <laughs> yeah well, that's right. And, you know, even though there was... You know, probably mitigating circumstances, the result went their way. Yeah. St Kilda finished with about 17 fit blokes that night. That's just the reality of it. Yeah. That's that Eddie had, um, fast track. Melbourne are a team that are all, also progressing. Yeah. But to answer your question, I, I really think St Kilda, based on their evenness across the ground, they're working for each other and their understanding of each other's roles within the team at any given time, is making them more a team than ever. Yeah. And in this modern game, you have to operate as a team better than what the opposition do over the two hours of battle. And and my point was, the key player for St Kilda, and not because he's going to be a key forward, if they can get another season like they got out of the last season out of Nick Rewald, no, he, he was just revitalised. He, his, his, to mine, he hasn't lost any pace. And his gut running is nearly as good as just about anyone's in the league. And he's because he's so tall, it makes it very hard to man up if he's playing on a wing. I, I have to say, just again, you know, making my observations that that's a great coaching. Um, yeah, move. It, whatever, whatever the right thing is, yeah. it's great coaching involved in that because he seemed to take all the pressure off him. Yeah. That we've got all these talented young blokes. You're no longer the main man. Just go out there and play footy, and it, it seemed to benefit yeah. from it enormously. When you got McCart and Memory and also Bruce, you can probably afford to do that. And what it does is, it's hard in coaching to get the balance right of coaching for the now, but also having an eye for the future. Mm. So they've identified that Nick, with his knee and debilitating need is, as, as a warrior he is, you've got to make probably a judgment call. Has he got one year left, two years left, maybe three max? But in this period of time, while he's here for education purposes, let's get him out of the being the pee in the pod. And let's try to develop them other three players to see if they can work together in a co busy fashion. Synergy in forward play is extremely important. And the reason why I say that, in 06 when we had Fraser Geary, we had Aaron Hamill, we had Nick Rewalt, and we had Justin Kaczynski as forwards, they'd be really see ball, get ball type players. And quite invariably, you get Robert Harvey or Lenny Hayes or Nick Del Sano or Brendan Goddard, Luke Ball coming in midfield. They look up and they see four guys running to the same area of turf. So they'd invite their four defenders into that area. Yeah. So often there'd be an 8v4 yeah. uh, v in the air. That, to me, is no synergy. Yeah. So until then, boys understood forward play, running patterns, working for each other and away from each other, then you'd be able to maximise the space that gets diluted yeah. because of the geographic of Bramley Stadium. Yeah. It turns into that bottom part of the egg yeah. the closer you get to goal. So I think with McCartan, Bruce and Memory, with the influence of midfielders that they've now got, yeah. with Rewalt getting up to be a sliding winger, there's another forward option, but also to work behind for defensive actions, yeah. uh, they're much better set up. And we couldn't have a preview without talking about the team that everyone's talked about for the last couple of years with their drug scandal. I, there's a lot of Bombers supporters that I'm talking to that seem to be getting out of themselves. They think that now they've got these gun players back that we're going to play finals and I say there's been a trickle of money for them to win the flag. I can't even possibly entertain that. I think it's going to take them a good six, eight, ten weeks 
because I to try and just get that get the synergy get the get the patterns worked out I think it's going to take them some time to bet in I know they've got a lot of talent back but I've watched them closely over the summer yeah um, just to go and watch them try I've got, I've got a great relationship with Mark Harvey and oh yeah um, obviously I spoke to James Hurd on last Friday and he's coming to do a business lunch at the footy club yeah um, so I've got some connections there with the guys and I respect um, the club as a, as a whole yeah um, what they stand for obviously the last five years has been turmoil yeah um, who points what finger at who um, we'll never know the answer we still don't know the truth no. and that's the thing that infuriated me on radio yeah and still infuriates me now because it was the players that when you go into a system like that Chappy and Potsy you are in a way a bit of a sheep as a yeah. young kid if a doctor says go and take that you just do without yeah. asking questions it takes a brave man at 18 or 19 or 20 to say hang on a minute hang on, I'm not doing what's, this what's, what's this? this about mm. it's a bit like monkey see monkey do yeah. Joe Watson walked in and did what he did and I was jeez Joe the captain's going yeah, in but well, he can't do it if Joe Dyson Heppel and the next one like, all, 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 all walk in front of you you yeah. just follow. Yeah, follow yeah so with them watching them over over summer train I felt they were very um, um, deliberate in what, how they wanted to play yeah um, good players find synergy pretty quickly. Yeah. Um, they come back, they've played a lot of footy together. I'm talking Watson, Heppel, Stanton, Hooker, these types of guys. Yeah. They've played at Hurley. They've played a hell of a lot of footy together. So I haven't got a problem with the synergy aspect. I'm worried about their tempo. Yeah. When you lose that tempo for 12 months, how quick can you get it get back? back. Matches, match simulation. Yeah. You can run and do volume running, but the reflex that are required, the quick decisions that you have to make, and I even found it watching the initial stages of the JLT, they were just that half second off. Yeah. And in offence and defence, if you're that half second off, it's to make a calculated decision that's right, for the ball to be travelled as opposed to turned over, that could be the difference in winning and losing. Yeah. Um, speaking of the footy club, Mick, what are you up to now? You're out there coaching at Deal <coughs> again? Yep, they're yeah, doing it again. Um, just love the involvement. Coach the under-10s last year, won a flag there. Coach the seniors, won a flag there. Um, really enjoyed the connection with te- developing kids. We've got we've got nine players in the AFL yeah. system at a Kiwa Footy Club right wow. now. That's unbelievable. So we put a lot of time and effort to give kids yeah. a chance to live their dream. We've got Damien Kavkabat. He's a great story in itself. Um, picked in the mid '60s, goes to West Coast Eagles, wins their time trials. His foot explodes more or less. Um, his footy dreams over. Uh, he started training with us about four weeks ago in the view that there might be a chance for him to play senior footy again with us. Um, so we're just waiting that that can be the case. He's rediscovered his passion for the game. If his body holds up, we love giving kids a game of footy. Yep. Um, that's what we're there for. How yep. old is he now? Uh, he's only 21. Right, well. He's a baby. Well, 22 he might be now. Um, young Venables got picked up at West Coast. Um, a pick 13 so last yep. year. And in one draft, in the Kavka draft, we had three boys, or four boys drafted with three in the top 20. Um, we had O'Hearn, we haven't seen any of because he's done his knee twice at, at GWS. He's now at North Melbourne. Yep. Uh, young Corey Ellis, left footers, playing halfback, predominantly at the Tigers. And Jaden Laverde was picked 20. So we derive an enormous amount of benefit from those that work behind the scenes, volunteers, um, to really make these kids live their dreams. So we, we think if they can uh, get to AFL footy, it gives us a reason as to why we turn up and try to teach them. And, and for a lot of people that probably didn't know, there's been a lot of change in local and country footy here in Victoria over the last year or two. We've moved to a point system and a salary cap system. So um, I know it was being connected with a couple of country clubs as well. Like you'd often find that the top teams, if they had the money, they'd just go out by the players. And there was essentially, in a lot of cases, there was no hope for the teams that were just local clubs that had local blokes that coming off the farm or were tradies or worked in an office or whatever they did, there was no there was such a big gap between the top and the bottom that that it was the only time where they had to make a change, didn't they? Yeah they did and we call them boom or bus clubs. Yeah. Um, they try to explode with their budget, try to recruit some heavyweights. Yeah. Um, but those heavyweights are either only got one or two years left in them. Yeah. They grab their cash, the cash cow and they go. Yeah. Um, I, I see that as a missed opportunity to give a 19, 18, 17 year old kid who's three year junior system an yep. opportunity to grow as a male, to connect with some really strong adults. Yep. And let's face it, the, the junior world's totally different than the so, oh, world. Yeah. And we have to try to fast track that education. Yep. And there's no better place to entertain that than your own club. Yep. Um, so we, that's our policy. Um, we don't break the budget, we try to keep it um, affordable so we don't break any promises when it comes to financials. Um, more importantly, we're given our own 
who invest in the junior program, but also when their time's to take their L plate off and put the P plate on, uh, they're ready to go for senior footy. And not only that, that massively benefits the club too. Long term. Because there's a point system, and if you've come through the juniors, is it zero point. points or one point? Yeah. So you're not burning up a heap of points by having to bring players in and you're not busting your salary cap either. No, you're not. And it's not for that purpose to bust no. the salary cap. We want to look after our own to the value yeah. of what we think they're worth. Yeah. Now other clubs, based on market value, they think a player's worth X and they might offer him X. Yeah. Well, we, we stick to our dig and we think we don't want to get in a bidding war just because um, the Chinese influence comes to a yearling sale. I've got yeah. 200,000 to bet and they want to pay two million for it. Well, good luck, take it, because yeah. I'm not going there. And we have the same mentality for a horse, uh, for, a, for a player. Well, it's essentially no different to what we're doing here. All we're doing is talking about value. We put a perceived value on something, yep. Does whether it be the price of the horse is going around in a race, you're putting a perceived price on a player. Correct. If he wants to go and test the open market, he can. Otherwise, there's the price, it's there. As yep. well isn't that for <coughs> our racehorse punters there? Yep. The value is in the unexposed young ones. Correct. Yep. That's where the value is. Not in every case, but in the vast majority. Yep. Yeah, and, and it's, 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 it's one of the great satisfactions too, obviously working with young boys that become great men. Yeah. Not only are we talking football, but more importantly, the, you know, the, I call them you know, the Spartan qualities of life. They're required in footy. Mm. We ask for responsibility. We ask for courage. We ask for um, more or less promptness coming to training, just the common sense element of what football and life offers. I'm not sure whether common sense is that common anymore, mm -hmm. but we've got to try to teach it and deliver it, the values of honesty, the values of respect. Yeah. Um, when you've got a good sound club, who want to, they turn up for the right reasons because they know who they're representing. They're not only representing the jumper on their back, but they're representing you who's the boot stud, and they're representing you who works in the gander and every week. They're representing the sponsor. You, whatever it may yeah. be. You become an extension of your community. And that's what we try to sell at the place. It, yeah. You don't just want 20, you don't want 40 champions on your list, you'd rather have 40 good citizens on your list that you can then build with. Yeah, absolutely. And that's what our mojo is. Um, we're here to develop the person. If you develop the person, you develop the player. If you develop the player, you develop the team. If you develop the team, you develop the club. That to me is the bottom line. Now, one other question. Have you guys got a good Friday game this year? Yeah, we have. Well. Where's that played? Uh, yeah, we play Strathmore, which yep. is uh, Nathan Grimer is actually coaching there this year, ex-North Melbourne, and he was at Essendon last year to help out there, and uh, Michael ferretto has gone there, Hamish McIntosh was a part of their system uh, last year as well. Todd Grimer, he'll play with his brother Nathan, yep. Alex, the other brother, he'll play together. So there's a massive, Adam Yakabuchi, he's a yep. fantastic player, he was a Collingwood's list, captain of all the, uh, the Bull Ants back then. So there's a plethora of great players in the NFL. It's a really good competition. It's a hard competition to win. Uh, we were privileged enough to win the reserves and seniors premiership last year. We haven't gone out and win just to recruit for the sake of recruiting. We'll put a lot of faith in our reserve players who yep. played some really good consistent footy last year at that level. We'll find out now whether they can um, step up uh, and play at a high level. But uh, we've got an enormous amount of faith in those young guys. Well, there's a tip, punters. If you're looking for something to do on a non-race day on Good Friday, Head out and catch that game. There'll be a big crowd there. I would have yeah, thought. Yeah, we generally get four or five thousand people there. A few cans on the sidelines. It'd be plenty worse ways to spend the day. Nick, it's been an absolute pleasure having no, you, mate. We really, really time. appreciate you taking the time to come on with us. No worries, Jeff. Um, Absolutely. Good on you. Thank Good you very much for coming on. I reckon we could have filled that free show. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> a million things we could keep talking about all day. Yeah. Well, I was on the side of the punters. Mick touched on it earlier. A race that uh, Mr. Sneaky won, and um, the answer my friend ran second. Darren, we have one uh, rock star rebel. Yeah, ran on very well. It's in tomorrow at Sandown. It's a remarkably good price in the early market. I think it'll win as a, as a fairly dominant favourite tomorrow. Okay, yeah. so lots of set man tasks to try and get this show up by Sandown tomorrow. <laughs> so <laughs> maybe you can tweet it out. That'll be that'll be the next thing. Thanks very much for joining us, punters. Thanks again, Mick. Um, good luck for the season at Keylor, and uh, we'll catch you again next week. Good luck, punters. See you guys.